Heavenly Father, we are just so grateful that we can come together and study your word to show ourselves approved. I thank you, Father, for the teaching tonight, which is on righteousness, which comes directly from your son, Jesus Christ, to us. And I just pray once again, you open up our understanding, you give us rich revelation, that as we read the scripture verses that are relevant tonight to the topic of righteousness, that we would grow in wisdom, discernment, knowledge, and truth. And Father, once again, we want to give you all the glory, honor, and praise for you alone are worthy of it. I thank you for those that are here. I thank you for those that will be watching this video. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would continue to lead us and guide us forward in our quest to become more like Jesus. And Father, we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, once again, welcome. Good evening. I'm going to ask you to open up your pamphlets to page two. And we're going to begin tonight, as we always do, by sharing the purpose of this lesson. You can see it in point number one, one. The purpose of this lesson is to gain a fundamental understanding of what true righteousness is and how it affects the life and attitude of the believer. Armed with this revelation, we are able to live lives that are empowered through an attitude of righteous consciousness, as opposed to living from a debilitating and faith crippling state of sin consciousness. So as we begin this lesson, our righteousness comes from Christ alone, and that's how we walk in victory. We're going to start by looking at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 7 in the New King James Version. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace." So the first thing we're going to do in this lesson is define righteousness. The Greek word dikazune means the character or quality of being right or just. In right standing or uprightness before God. Being in right standing with God, not owing anything as in accounting. Righteousness is the very nature of God. The word suggests conformity to the revealed will of God in all respects. Dikazone is both judicial and gracious. God declares the believer, sinner, righteous in the sense of acquitting him by imparting, imparting righteousness to him. So we are in right standing with the Father only through the Son. We're saved by grace and faith not by works that no one should boast. It's a gift from God. So we are righteous because of Jesus Christ. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we may become the righteousness of God in him. So what does that mean? He who knew no sin became sin for us. Christ bore our sins on the cross and endured the penalty that we deserved, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, when there was a sacrifice, a sin offering, it covered the sins of the people. It was a covering. Jesus took our sins upon himself, and he not only covers our sins, he completely obliterates them, destroys them. They exist no more. We have a better covenant and we have a better high priest. 
And there's other scripture references here. I'm not going to turn there, but they're for your own reading. And I would encourage you to read them. Romans 8, 3 and 4, 1 Corinthians 1, 30, and Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Read those verses on your own time and understand truly what Jesus did on the cross. We are made right with him through his sacrifice, his death, his burial, his resurrection alone. Key words related to understanding righteousness. Redemption. What does that word redemption mean? This concerns the release from penalty by the payment of a price or a ransom. It actually means to buy back. To redeem means to buy back. And that is important that we understand that. Not only did Jesus conquer our sins, but he took away the penalty for our sin. He released us. He paid the ransom for us. Let's turn to the next page, page three. Another key word that we need to understand is justification. Being declared just, righteous, as in a court of law, acquitted of all allegations. That means the judge in a court has the authority to either declare you guilty or innocent, and he also has the authority to either to remove the sentence that you have been given because he is the judge. So justification means being declared just righteous as in a court of law acquitted of all allegations. The word doesn't mean to make one righteous, but to account one as righteous. So because of Jesus, we are accounted as righteous. God justifies us at the beginning of our Christian walk, not at the end. We're justified through Christ alone. That's why once we become born again, we're no longer called sinners, but saints because of justification of Christ. Propitiation, what does that mean? It's another word, propitiation. This concerns the averting of God's wrath against ungodliness. We know that God pours out his wrath upon all sin, that God will judge all sin. The Bible says many times, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. We know that at the end of all days, in the book of Revelation, God will judge this earth completely and eventually renew it. New heaven, new earth. Everything will be judged and redeemed. At the great white throne judgment, every human being that ever existed will be judged for what they did while on this earth. So propitiation, this concerns the averting of God's wrath against ungodliness. Jesus took God's wrath upon himself for us. Sanctification, this is the process. You hear me talk about this a lot on Sundays. We are all in process. What's the process? The process of becoming holy is a progressive work of divine grace upon the soul justified by the love of Christ. I'm going to read that again. The process of becoming holy, the word holy means to be set apart. We're set apart by God and for God. So there's a process and it's a progressive work of divine grace upon the soul justified by the love of of Christ. We're made up of three parts. We're a trichotomy, spirit, soul, and body. The spirit is regenerated by God through Jesus Christ. The soul is the will, the intellect, and the emotions. That is the part of us that is in process. Our soul, our will, intellect, and emotions. And the Holy Spirit and the Word are working on us. They're sanctifying us, making us more like Jesus. So sanctification is divine grace upon the soul justified by the love of Christ. And we know that that's the key of the gospel, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever shall believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save it, John three sixteen and 17. That is the core component of the gospel. So point number three, the need for righteousness. God's plan for man is holiness. 
We just said holiness means to be set apart. Holiness is the requirement for righteousness. Holy means to be set apart unto God, set apart from sin or uncleanness, dedicated and devoted to him alone. So that is why we need righteousness. Ephesians 1, 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And this is the theme that we see throughout the scriptures that God is sovereign. He calls us first before we come to him. The Holy Spirit draws us to the Father through the Son. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. But he who called you again, God calls us first, is holy and you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. So holiness is the work of Jesus Christ in our lives, bringing us into a state of righteousness. So there's positional righteousness that we inherit through faith and grace in Christ alone. It's part of the better covenant that we have in and through Jesus. And then there is the sanctification process of becoming holy and set apart. The work of righteousness. And God calls us to live holy in all of our conduct. That's what he desires of us. So again, holiness is the work of Jesus Christ in our lives, bringing us into a state of righteousness. Walking in righteousness. So we've defined the terms of what righteousness is, the need for righteousness that God's plan requires us to have. And now we're going to talk about walking in righteousness. What does that mean? What does that look like? Again, the scriptures give us the clear definition. The following portion of scripture provides three clear steps to walking in righteousness. Three steps. Romans chapter 5 verse 19 through chapter 6 verse 13. Follow with me as I read it from the New King James Version. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners because of Adam's disobedience. God gave Adam the authority to lead. So it falls upon him, his disobedience. We were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense may, might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so might reign, might, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin, live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into G Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, verse six, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Verse 11 says this, Likewise, 
you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So let's dissect that and break it down. If we have died to sin, we should no longer continue living in it. Just because we're saved by grace and faith, not by works, does not give us a license to continue to sin. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us the exact opposite. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9, it says, Do not be deceived, for none of these shall enter the kingdom of heaven. And it gives a laundry list of sin. It says, But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So if we're truly born again, born in spirit, we do not have a desire to live in sin anymore. Our desire, our appetite is towards the things of God and towards the love of the Father because we've been redeemed. So the steps to making this a reality in our lives are as follows. Point number four, two, one, knowing. Verse three says, those who are baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death. Verse six says, the old man was crucified with him. Our old sinful nature was crucified with Christ. Verse 9 says, death has no dominion over Christ or over those who are in him. Jesus conquered sin and death on the cross and he's given us life and abundant life. This highlights the importance of baptism, the symbolism of baptism. This knowing is not an intellectual knowledge, but revelation knowledge and I an opening of the eyes of the heart to see what we have in Christ. When you are born again, you see with new eyes, you hear with new ears. This is a spiritual birth. It's not a physical birth. It's spiritual. And we need to understand that. Flesh is the manifestation of sin in our, in our lives as yet unredeemed bodies. Our bodies are still sinful in their sinful state and nature. Whereas the old man is an all-inclusive term of everything we were in Adam. So knowing is the first step. The second step is reckoning. Reckon ourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God. The Greek word for reckoning is logizomai, which means to count it as done. Reckoning is based on divinely revealed facts. Otherwise, our faith has no foundation on which to rest. Reckoning is of the mind and involves giving assent to a fact. Faith is of the heart and involves bringing into reality what we have decided to do. Faith is a willful, intentional decision to believe that everything God says in his word is true based on the facts that we have reckoned. We have resolved this in our mind and our heart, and we choose to walk by faith and not by sight. So the knowing, the reckoning, and then the presenting, verse 13. Ourselves to God as alive from the dead and our members as instruments of righteousness to God. And it says, see Romans 12, one there, we're not gonna turn there. But basically, presenting is stronger than yielding, implying deliberate and assertive surrender. Romans 12, 1 says, present yourselves as a living sacrifice unto the Lord, for that is your reasonable act of worship. So how you live your life is how you present yourself before God. Faith without works is dead. We're studying the book of James in the men's discipleship class. And it's important that we don't just agree with the scriptures, but our faith is active and alive. We don't just agree with it, we live it out. It's a willful, intentional decision act of obedience. Authority, alignment, obedience. That's what we're called. That's how we're called to live. So in the verses that we read, the steps once again are knowing, 
reckoning, and presenting. Let's continue. How do we do this work? Well, we need help. Who is our help? The Holy Spirit. He is our helper. Romans chapter 8, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. It's the victory chapter. We know who we are in Christ. Chapter 7 of Romans, Paul is struggling in his flesh. He's battling. And in verses 14 and 15, he says, why do I do the things I don't want to do when I know the things that I should do? He comes to this reality. It's not me, but sin in me. In other words, the flesh is still alive and active, fighting and warring with the spirit. So as he's struggling, as he's wrestling with God, as he's praying, the Lord gives him Romans 8, the revelation of victory. And our victory is through Christ alone. And we need help. And that's why God gave us the Holy Spirit, our helper. Let's look at Romans 8, 1 to 4. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So this is the revelation that Paul is getting after he said, why do I do the things I don't want to do when I know the things that I should do? He's getting this revelation. Verse three, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, the flesh is weak, we know that, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So what's the promise of this great victory that we receive through Christ alone? The promise of no condemnation. It is a positional truth for those who are in Christ Jesus. That means it is not conditional on the behavior of the believer. That means you're justified by faith in Christ alone, and there's no condemnation. The devil is the accuser of the brethren. He seeks to kill, rob, and destroy. He's always going to try to condemn you with your past, condemn you with temptation, condemn you through others that he uses as vehicles to come against you at times. But we have to be anchored in the truth and know who we are in Christ. There is no condemnation, only justification. So condemnation cannot be dealt with by sanctification. That's the process of becoming like Jesus, only by justification. And we're justified through Christ alone. That's the gift of salvation. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. It's free. So the justification comes with salvation. The sanctification is the process of becoming more like Jesus. Two different things. Very important. So we don't walk around feeling guilty. We'll walk around every day thinking we're losing our salvation every time we mess up. We are justified in Christ alone. Amen? So the secret to living a life that is free from any form of condemnation, sin consciousness or guilt is to focus our hearts and minds on walking according to the Spirit. This is always the key. The victory is always in Christ. When we keep our eyes focused on the kingdom, when we keep our eyes focused on the King, Lord Jesus, we will rise above the temptations, the schemes, the strategies of the devil. We will rise above the challenges of the world and the world system. The key is keeping focus on the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all its righteousness, then all else shall be added unto you. Matthew 6, 33. Very important we understand that. So let's continue in this victory chapter, Romans chapter 8. And read verses 5 to 10. For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, to be, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is an enmity against God, 
for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, if you're born again. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, here's an important takeaway from these verses. The word subject in verse 7 means to arrange in order under. This is talking about authority. This deals with subjection, obedience, yielding, and submitting. During the process of sanctification, as we're growing and maturing in the things of God, one of the hardest parts of maturing is submitting. A lot of us don't like that word submission. A lot of us don't like to submit to people or submit to authority, whether it's governmental authority, legal authority, lawful authority. That is an issue of the heart and God wants to break that sinful mindset, attitude, behaviors in us so we will be submissive first and foremost to him. The only way you can exercise authority and be in a position of authority is through submitting to authority. It's the only way. And I'm going to read what I read again. This deals with subjection, obedience, yielding, and submitting. The carnal mind cannot come under the control of the word of God. Only the spiritual man can. That's why people who are not born in spirit, they, they hate the Bible. They hate what the Bible represents. They hate what the word says because it is against the flesh. It's against our carnal nature. Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. This is why we have a better covenant. This is why we have a better promise. The indwelling Holy Spirit gives life to a body that is subject to sin and has no power over it in order for the body to manifest holiness. Without the Holy Spirit, there's no way we can be set apart and live holy for God. There is no way. Your flesh is wicked. It's sinful. Jeremiah says it's desperately wicked. Who should know it but God? And that's why God's wrath is poured out against sin. God is holy and he cannot dwell where there is sin. That's why we are dead to God in our trespasses. Ephesians chapter 2. We're dead to God in our sins, but made alive to God in and through Christ Jesus, our Lord. So without being born again, you're dead to God. And a lot of people think they're good people, but the Bible tells us, and God says it very clearly, we're not good in and of our own sinful nature. We're wicked, we're evil, we're adulterers, we're murderers, we're slanderers. We're all kinds of wickedness because those things have the capacity to become alive in us. They're a part of our sinful nature. I share this analogy a lot when I talk about sin nature. I have three kids. When my two older boys were young, they're only a year and a half apart. One time they were playing together in a room. I was watching them and smiling and laughing, saying, look at how nice they're playing together. And then the younger one tried pulling the toy out of the older one's hand. The older one took the toy and smashed him over the face with it and hit him. And he's crying and he's pulling on it. You saw the anger, the wrath, the, the murderous thoughts in two toddlers fighting. That's sin. Sinful nature. We're born with it. So we're dead to God because of our sin. We're only made alive to God through Christ. So the carnal mind cannot come under the control of the word of God. That's why the Bible says don't feed pearls to swine. If you do, they will attack you with it and trample on you. I see these evangelists go into certain gatherings and functions where people are immersed in sinful behavior and they preach the gospel and then they get physically attacked, beaten, thrown things at them. Well, you're feeding pearls to swine. Jesus said, go into a town, preach the gospel. If people accept it, stay. If they don't, wipe the dust off of your feet and leave. Be wise as a serpent and gentle as a dove. That's what we're called to do. 
don't give pearls to swine. And the Holy Spirit will give us that wisdom and sensitivity of who to speak to. He'll lead us and guide us into all truth. He'll lead us towards certain people, especially if we're praying that way. And we're asking the Lord to use us every day to give us divine appointments and opportunities. God will open doors that no man can open. So the Holy Spirit is the counselor, the comforter, and the guide. So he dwells in us. The indwelling spirit, the Holy Spirit, gives life to a body that is subject to sin and has no power over it for the body to manifest holiness. Christ's resurrection power at work in us, the same spirit who raised Christ. If this power of God was sufficient to raise Christ from the dead, it is certainly adequate to ensure our victory over temptation. That's why I share with you that verse in Ephesians 6, 9. Do not be deceived, for none of these shall enter the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't mean that you'll never sin again. Because you, you, you got the sinful nature which wars against the spirit. But what it means is you cannot live in a habitual state of sin if you are filled with the Holy Spirit. The conviction of the Holy Spirit will break you, bring you to your knees, to repentance. And the Holy Spirit, he is the change agent. What we cannot do for ourselves, he does for us. That's why we need him. That's why we have to rely on the Holy Spirit's power, the resurrection power of Christ to become new in Christ. I hope you understand that. You can't change yourself. How many people make New Year's resolutions that you break constantly? I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to work out. You buy a gym membership. You go three times and you pay for it for a year and you don't work out. Or I'm going to stop cursing. I'm going to stop lying. I'm going to stop stealing. In your own strength, you cannot do those things. Only when you submit to the Lordship of Jesus through true repentance. And the Spirit will bring you back to that place of conviction and repentance. And then He comes in and does the inner work and the change. Then you're walking in the victory that's given through Him alone. Not through yourself. So no one can boast. Nobody can say, I'm good enough. None of us are good enough. We all need God. We all need the Spirit. Very clear. Point number six, peace with God. The primary fruit of righteousness is peace with the Lord. Romans 5.1 Therefore, have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace means to be in harmony and to enjoy harmonious relationships. The result of this peace is a quietness and assurance in our souls. Only Jesus can produce that kind of peace. Peace that surpasses all understanding. Romans 5, 3 to 5. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Isn't that a great verse? We can hold on to that hope. Quietness comes from the word shakat, means to be at rest or to be settled. We shouldn't be anxious and fearful and worried when we're rooted and anchored in Christ. We have his peace to still the quietness of our souls. Assurance from the word batach means a place of refuge and safety, both as a fact, security, and a feeling trust. That's our identity. We are hidden in Christ. That's where we get the peace, the rest, and the trust from. This peace forms the foundation of our character. It's what makes us different than the world, right? When people see Christ in you, a lot of times they're going to say, there's something different about you. I don't know what it is. How come you're not complaining like the rest of us? How come you're not angry at what's going on in the world? How come People, when they see Christ in you, they see that calm assurance that peace, that rest in your soul. 
And that makes them want to desire and know what makes you different. And that's when you have an opportunity to share your faith. Say, it's not me, it's Christ in me. You really want to know? I'll tell you. And you can share your testimony. Perfect way to lead people towards Jesus. Remember, we can't save anybody. We lead people towards Christ. Point number seven, engaging in God's grace. Romans 5, 2. Through whom also we have access by faith into his grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. I'm going to read that again. Through whom we also have access by faith into his grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Only a believer who experiences true peace with God can boldly access to his grace. What is his grace? God, grace is God's power and ability enabling us to do that which we cannot do ourselves. It's everything God is, has, and can do at our disposal through Christ Jesus. Let's look at the quote by Andrew Murray. God will work according to the riches of his glory to lift us out of our feebleness and bring us into a new life that will be lived to his praise and glory. What is the purpose of being filled with the Holy Spirit? To be a witness for Christ, to be empowered, to stand for truth and righteousness, and to represent God well this side of heaven. 2 Corinthians 9.8 and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. Only a revelation of righteousness will set us free from living lives subject to sin. You gotta receive it as a revelation. Carnality and weakness, those attributes, attributes belong to our old man, which means our old nature. We need to see ourselves as Christ sees us, righteous and accepted in the beloved. This revelation gives us great peace and boldness in approaching God. It forms the foundation of our faith and character and is essential to live a victorious life in the blessing and providence of God. Meditate on the scriptures below who you are in Christ until they become a revelation to you. This is our identity. You know, I've said this many times in preaching and teaching. If people ask you about yourself, what do you tell them? People that are in the world, that are carnal, usually would someone ask you, so tell me about yourself. Well, I grew up in New York. I'm Italian. I'm American. I'm this, I'm that. We, we share our attributes, our characteristics based on our flesh. But when our identity is rooted in Christ, we're much more than just the physical. We have characteristics of eternity living in us in Christ. So we need to know our identity in Christ to have victory in Christ. And you need to always remember this daily because when the enemy comes in like a flood, it is the spirit of God that raises up a standard. So one of the things I, I tried doing early on in my Christian walk was scripture memorization. And the way I did it was I would take topics, things that I knew I struggled in, fear, insecurity, doubt, whatever my battles were, I would look up all the scripture verses that had to do with those things, write them out on index cards and read them over and over again until they got in me so that I can just speak them. And the minute that fear came, that anxiety came, that anger came, I would quote that verse. And like a fire extinguisher, it would put out the fear, the confusion, the anxiety. That's how powerful the word is. That's how I overcame anxiety. I had a lot of anger and anxiety when I was young. And when I got saved and when the word became my sword and my shield, the anxiety left and never came back. And the confidence and the victory increases every day because I know who I am in Christ. You need to know who you are in Christ. The devil can lie to you. He will lie to you. He'll try to deceive you. He'll try to get you away from the word, get you away from prayer, get you away from the things of God. That is always his mode of operandi. That is his strategy. So you have to know the enemy's strategy and arm yourself with the truth. So let's look at these verses 
And I love the way it states here in, in section eight. God's view of me. Who I am in Christ. How does God see you? He doesn't see you in your sinful state and nature. He sees you as a victor covered by the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. He sees you in a position of righteousness. That's what this lesson is about. So let's look at these verses. I am God's child, for I am born again of the incorruptible seed of the living and abiding word of God that endures. 1 Peter 1, 23 and John 1, 12. Forgiven, I am forgiven of all my sins and washed in the blood. Ephesians 1, 7, Hebrews 9, 14, Colossians 1, 14, 1 John 2, 12, and 1 John 1, 9. Now I'm gonna give you a little tool exercise to help you memorize scripture. Write it out. Don't just read it, write it out. When the kings and the prophets were called by God, they were called to meditate on the word day and night and write it out till they memorized it. And when it was in them, whenever they needed it, it would come out. They would pull out the sword. The offensive weapon is the sword. And when you know the sword, when you know how to use your sword, when the enemy comes in, you can chop his head off. So we need to know the word and know our identity in Christ. I am a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5.17 I am the temple of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, and 1 Corinthians 6, 19. I am redeemed from the curse of the law, Galatians 3, 13. I am redeemed from my futile way of life, inherited by my forefathers, 1 Peter 1, 18. I am delivered from the power of darkness and translated into God's kingdom, Colossians 1.13. I am called of God, 2 Timothy 1.9. I am a partaker of his divine nature, 2 Timothy 1.4. I am the righteousness of God, First, 2 Corinthians 5.21, 1 Peter 2.24. I am chosen by God, 1 Thessalonians 1.4, Ephesians 1.4. I am elect, Colossians 3.12. I am established to the end. 1 Corinthians 1.8. I am made near by the blood of Christ. Ephesians 2.13. I am victorious. Revelation 21.11. I am set free. John 8.31-33 and Romans 6.22. I am strong in the Lord. Ephesians 6.10. I am dead to sin. Romans 6.2. Romans 6.11. 1 Peter 2.24. I am more than a conqueror. Romans 8.37. I am joint heirs with Christ. Romans 8.17. I am sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 1.13. I am in Christ Jesus by his doing. 1 Corinthians 1.30. I am accepted in the beloved. Ephesians 1.6. I am complete in him, Colossians 2.10. I am crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20. I am alive with Christ, Ephesians 2.5. I am free from condemnation, Romans 8.1. I am reconciled to God, 2 Corinthians 5.18 and Romans 5.11. I am qualified to share in his inheritance, Colossians 1.12. That is a lot of I am's and we're not done yet. Turn the page. I am firmly rooted, built up, established in my faith and overflowing with gratitude, Colossians 2, 7. I am circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, Colossians 2, 11. I am a fellow citizen with the saints of the household of God, Ephesians 2, 19. I am built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, Ephesians 2.20. I am as he said he is in this world, 1 John 4.17. I am born of God, Jesus keeps me, and the evil one does not touch me, 1 John 5.18. I am his faithful follower, Revelation 17.14, Ephesians 5.1. 
I am overtaken with blessing. Deuteronomy 28, 2, Ephesians 1, 3. I am his disciple because I have love for others. John 3, 34 and 35. I am the light of the world, Matthew 5, 14. I am the salt of the earth, Matthew 5, 13. I am blessed, Deuteronomy 28, 1 to 4, Galatians 3, 9. I am a saint, not a sinner. Romans 1, 7, 1 Corinthians 1, 2, Philippians 1, 1. I am the head and not the tail, Deuteronomy 28, 13. I am above only and not beneath, Deuteronomy 28, 13. I am holy and without blame before him in love, elect, Ephesians 1, 4. I am an ambassador for Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 20. I am God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, Ephesians 2, 10. I am the apple of my father's eye, Deuteronomy 32, 10, Psalm 17, 8. I am healed by the stripes of Jesus. 1 Peter 2.24, Isaiah 53.5. I am being changed into his likeness. 2 Corinthians 3.18, Philippians 1.6. I am raised up with Christ and seated in the heavenly places. Colossians 2.12, Ephesians 2.6. I am beloved of God. Colossians, Colossians 3.12, Romans 1.7, 1 Thessalonians 1.4. I am one in Christ with my brothers and sisters. John 17, 21 to 23. I am the first fruits among his creation. James 1, 18. Now we're going to switch from I am to I have. I have the mind of Christ. Philippians 2, 5, 1 Corinthians 2, 16. I have obtained an inheritance. Ephesians 1, 11. I have access by one spirit unto the Father. Hebrews 4, 16, Ephesians 2, 18. I have overcome the world, 1 John 5, 4. I have everlasting life and will not be condemned, John 5, 24, John 6, 47. I have the peace of God which passes all understanding, Philippians 4, 7, Romans 5, 1. I have received power, the power of the Holy Spirit, power to lay hands on the sick and see them recover, power to cast out demons, power over the enemy, and nothing shall by means hurt me. Mark 16, 17, and 18. I have the greater one in me because greater is he who is in me than in the he that is in the world. 1 John 4, 4. Now we're going to switch to I live. I live by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 2. I walk in Christ Jesus. Colossians 2.6. I can do all things through Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.13. I can do greater works than Christ Jesus. John 14.12. And the final, my life is hidden with Christ in God. Colossians 3.3. 3. Now that's a lot to ingest. That is what we receive in and through the kingdom of God. That is who we are God's possession in Christ. We have the victory. God's given us authority to walk in obedience to his will and his plan. And we absolutely are more than conquerors in and through Christ. When you start believing like that, you understand righteousness. And you can walk and live a life of victory. That doesn't mean the enemy's not going to try to tempt you. He surely will. That doesn't mean that you're not going to have opposition. We know that God allows trials and tribulations to produce something in us. So it works for good in us. But we are victors always in Christ. Never a victim, always a victor. So as we come to the conclusion of this lesson, when we understand righteousness, there's justification through Christ alone. That's the covenant that we have inherited by faith and grace alone. So we are justified in and through Christ. And then there's the process of sanctification, which we are being sanctified. We are becoming like Jesus. And that's part of our righteousness. So our flesh is being put to death daily, as Paul instructs us throughout the scriptures. And we are becoming more alive in Christ as we focus and seek first the kingdom of God and all its righteousness. So as I give you these lessons, what I encourage you to do,
put them in a folder, read through them several times, pray over them and ask the Lord for wisdom and understanding. And this lesson, all these I am's, I have, get that deep in your spirit. Because once you have that confidence, no weapon formed against you will prosper. Until you have that assurance of the righteousness of Christ alive in you by faith and through the word and by the spirit, you're going to get slapped around a little bit. So God gives us the ability to live in victory, but we have to do the work. That's why James says faith without work is dead. Works is dead. We can't just agree with the scriptures. We have to live them out. We have to take ownership. And we do that by submitting to the will of the Father. And what is the will of the Father? That we would become disciples, students of his word, instruments of his righteousness, holy and set apart by him and for him. When you have that mindset, you cannot be moved. When Christ is the chief cornerstone of your heart, you're rooted. And nothing will be able to shake that foundation. Because the foundation is not yours, it's Christ's. And we're hidden in him, we're protected in him, we're blessed by him. We have the total victory in and through Christ. So this is a great lesson to ingest, regurgitate, ingest it again, regurgitate as much as you need for your mind to be renewed. Our mind gets renewed by replacing old thoughts, old habits, old behaviors. You have to release and then replace. We release through repentance. As the word brings conviction, as the word speaks truth and life to us, we take those thoughts captive, we subject them to Christ. That's what we do. We take thoughts captive, we subject them to Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 6. Our weapons of warfare are not carnal, but spiritual, able to tear down and pull down strongholds. Strongholds are mindsets, attitudes of the heart, thinking processes and behaviors. That's what strongholds are. And the only way you overcome evil is with good. Our sinful nature is inherently evil. That's why we have fear, confusion, doubt, frustration, anger, lust, murderous thoughts, all kinds of wickedness. Because our flesh is at enmity against God. But when we're born again, when we're born in the spirit, when we have the word as our sword and our faith as our shield, we can overcome the works of the devil. And we could overcome our flesh. And the only way you can win over your flesh is by killing it daily. You got to die to yourself daily in Christ. You got to be hidden in Christ. How are you hidden in Christ? When you're armed with the truth, which is the word of God. When you know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Great lesson. Very important lesson. You need to know who you are in Christ. You need to know you're in right standing with God because of Jesus alone. By his blood, by the covenant we have, the covenant of grace, and by living and walking by faith and not by sight. When you get to that place of maturity in your faith, you're a victor. You're no longer a victim. Whenever you try to defend yourself, whenever you become self-righteous, whenever pride and arrogance kick in, the devil has permission by God to smack you around. Until you repent and turn from your sin. Humble yourself before the Lord and he shall lift you up. That is the key to a victorious Christian life. So you're armed, this is armor. This is armor. This is treasure right here. This lesson is spiritual treasure. Treasure it. Don't throw it in the drawer and forget about it. Don't just hear me teach it and agree with me and sit there and go, yeah. And then you go out the door and it goes right in one ear and out the other. And the same attitudes and mindsets jump right back on you. You need to take ownership of this and ingest it and read it and study it and let it get in your heart. And that's when it becomes alive. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Father, I just thank you for this time tonight with my brothers and sisters. I thank you for the eternal truth in the scriptures, which gives us power, authority, significance, identity, and righteousness. We thank you.
for being in right relationship with you, Father. Only in and through your son, Jesus Christ. I pray that the word would go deep into the heart as Hebrews 4.12 says. The word is active and alive, sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces the bone, the heart, even the marrow. Separates asunder soul and spirit. It's a divider of the motives and intents of our hearts. Father, I pray tonight that your word would go that deep so that we can be fully identified in you and walk in victory every single day knowing who we are in Christ. Father, we give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. You alone are worthy of it. And I pray these things in the mighty matchless name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you for coming out. God bless you.